Putin would come up against the legendary Kalashnikov, the AK-47. Both of them will fire around about 600 rounds a minute, which is 10 a second. Uh, both of them will hold anything between 20 to 30 rounds. How do these weapons compare in an accuracy test? McIntyre is firing at a target 50 meters away. Five shots from each gun. All the rounds hit the target, but only the AK-47 gets close to the center of the black. The AK has the advantage that you can hit the target at a much longer range, and the ballistics are still lethal at those ranges. The 9mm really falls short of that and wouldn't be lethal at anything more than 100 meters. But in the close-up fight at Tel Fahir Bunker, long-range accuracy was not the deciding factor. It was smooth handling in a tight space that was more important. So how do these two weapons compare in a trench combat test? First, the Uzi. It's easy to use and quick to reload. Then, the AK-47. It's powerful, but slower to bring to bear than the Uzi, and reloading is not the same smooth process. In this test, it even jams. The Uzi is much better in confined spaces, much more pointable. This is much more like a traditional rifle. The AK requires a much kind of longer physical stance, whereas the Uzi can be used much easier close into the body. The ergonomics of the Uzi are much better. It has this design where hand naturally finds hand in case of a magazine change. That process is a lot more complicated on the AK because there is a lever here, which has to be pushed forwards. The magazine then has to come out. It's a very awkward action. It's far less intuitive to change the magazine on this than it would on the Uzi. It's a small weapon, it's a handy weapon. In the close quarters of a trench, when turning around with some great big long accurate rifle is not an option, Uzi's a nice little fella to have with you. Inside the Tel Fahir bunker, and many others like it on the Golan, the Uzi could have been the factor that gave the Israelis the edge. By the morning of Saturday, June 10th, the Syrians had been finally driven from their bunkers on the Golan Heights and were retreating to Damascus. The six-day war was over. In less than a week, Israel had defeated first Egypt, then Jordan, and finally Syria. But was this really Israel's brilliant military triumph? Or were critical mistakes by the Arab countries decisive? They didn't succeed to concentrate their forces all together against Israel. We fought each one alone. They couldn't make a real coalition and attack us all together. Though the Arab countries failed to combine their forces effectively, many soldiers in the Egyptian army believe to this day that they were not given the chance to do themselves justice in battle. They lost to the war, but they not defeated because they felt we did not fight because no chance to fight. But this was an historic victory for Israel. Never in the history of the wars of Israel so many people achieve such a huge victory in such a short time. We had a plan. It was worked in detail. It was properly trained for. And it was superbly carried out with a lot of luck. With a lot of luck. Years of training, planning, and intelligence gathering meant that Israel was able to minimize factors that were left to chance. The decisive factor was executing the plan uh, to the letter, based on strictly military measures, nothing to do with politics, and do not let politicians intervene. It was an Egyptian officer who said early in the war, the Israelis prepared for this war, we prepared, for parades through the streets of Cairo. In 1967, Israel was ready. Gene Kranz's flight controllers were only in their 20s when they took on one of the boldest missions in human history. 
placing a man on the moon. Failure is not an option. Tomorrow night at 8 on the History Channel. Even astronauts have heroes.